Thank you for joining me today. And welcome to the overview of prototyping with Adobe XD. So I'm Jonathan. I'm one of the product managers on the XD team. I've been with Adobe for close to seven years now. I started out as a designer, and now I focus on uh, XD, specifically on prototyping. With me today, we have Arun Kazar. And Arun's one of the other product managers who works with me as well. And the reason I asked Arun to join me today was because of one of the things we released at uh, Max yesterday, which we didn't get to touch upon during the keynote, but it's uh, a completely new mode in XT called Share Mode. And it plays a pretty critical part as you build your prototypes. So what we're going to do today is when we take you through some of the prototyping capabilities, Arun's going to join in and talk a little bit about how share mode plays a key part in that process. So how you can share your prototypes, how someone can view them, what you can do with your prototypes on the web, what you can do with it on mobile, what does the developer get to see from your prototypes. So we're going to mix and match things a little bit, but we're going to be focused completely on prototyping. The way I'm going to break down today's session is sort of four key areas. Uh, we're going to touch upon some of the basic prototyping capabilities in XT. We're going to look at some of the more advanced prototyping capabilities. And then there's an entire bucket that we call Beyond Screen. So we look at few capabilities within XT that allow you to prototype for voice, for game pads, for keyboards, things like that. And then, like I mentioned, Arun's going to talk, touch upon things like sharing and collaboration as a part of creating those prototypes. So before I get started, we're going to do a quick show of hands. How many of you all out here have used XD? That's awesome. OK. How many of you all have used XD for prototyping? OK. How many of you all are familiar with some of the advanced features like auto animate and voice? OK. How many of you all tried out states and hover? OK, we got a few. All right, so what I want to, the reason I asked you all that is so that I can pace myself and get a better understanding of which areas I'm going to spend more time in. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm definitely going to go through each of these sections. If you all have any questions, we're going to be there after the session to help answer them. If we run out of time and we need to move out, you can always find me down with the, at the community pavilion where you can meet the teams. There'll be a whole bunch of other XD folks as well. So with that, let's get started with the first one, which is basic prototyping. So for basic prototyping, there are a couple of things I always want to start out with. The first thing is, how do you actually go about prototyping in XT? So one of the things that's really unique to XT is the fact that it's a single tool that allow, allows you to design as well as prototype. So with that context, let's just quickly jump in. So you can see I've got a really big document over here. I've got a bunch of artboards. I've got a whole bunch of things laid out on my pasteboard. All of this is created using the design surface. You've got all your basic design tools. Now, when I switch over to prototype mode, you can see I can still select every single object the way I could in design mode. And what that allows me to do is really take my individual layers and start building interactions between them. So you don't have to like draw your hotspots, export specific PNGs. All of that goes away. You can just click on objects and start building connections. So let's look at a very simple flow for those of you who are new to XD on how you create a simple interaction. So let's say I'm on this artboard, and I want to create a simple interaction where someone taps on it, and it takes me to the next screen. So this is the most fundamental piece of prototyping. You select an object. You'll see a little blue arrowhead. You drag that out, and you connect it to whichever artboard you want to go, the destination. So I drop it over here. Now, for those of you who've used prototyping or XD in the past, you'll notice a couple of differences. The first thing is there's no pop-up that asks you for you know, what options you want to set. All of that is now on the right-hand side in what we call the property inspector. Now, the property inspector has a very simple model. You have a trigger, you have an action, and you have a destination. And that's essentially what we're going to use throughout this entire session. You pick a trigger, you pick what you want to do, and then you pick where you want to go. 
So in this case, my triggers tap. As we go through the whole session, we'll cover the rest of the triggers in detail. For my action, I'm gonna pick transition. And again, there's a whole bunch. We're gonna go through some of those as well. And my destination's automatically populated based on where I connected the wire. So with just so many, like with those few steps, now what I'm gonna do is open up my preview window by clicking on the play icon. And I can actually test the prototype right there in the preview window. So it transitions. Now this was a very simple example just to show you how you could go about wiring your screens. Once you do that, you can actually put together some really, really complex flows like this, where you've got multiple wires going across different screens, different links, all attached from multiple artboards. So with that context, let's look at a couple of key features that we have in XT. So here I have, an, I have a simple artboard, and this is a web page. So what I want to do is I want to make sure that when someone reviews this web page, they don't just see a giant image of the whole web page. They see a specific part, and then they scroll through it, like the way you would naturally interact with it in the browser. So in order to achieve that in XT, when you select your artboard, what you'll notice is we have a couple of options in the property inspector. The first thing is none. So if I set this to none and I open up the preview window, I get this giant image. It doesn't make sense. You're not gonna to wanna to share this with your stakeholders. So what you can do is switch from none to vertical. And that's the first feature I wanna talk about, which is scrolling in XT. So when I set this, to vertical, I get an option to set a viewport. And if I zoom out, you'll notice that the viewport currently is the edge of this artboard. So I'm gonna go ahead and change this to something else. And you can see I get this little dashed line, um, which I can actually scrub to adjust what my viewport is. So I'm gonna adjust it and leave it at that. And now what you'll notice is when I open up the preview window, it actually loads just that area of my prototype. And now I can actually scroll through the rest of it. So it gives me that quick experience of creating a scrollable artboard, whether it's a mobile app or desktop app or a website, it works for any kind of artboard. And you get to customize the viewport yourself. Now this looks great, this is scrolling, but typically when you create a web page, there are certain elements that are fixed, there are certain elements that scroll. How do you do that in XT? The next feature is what we call fixed elements. So let's go ahead and select this, this logo on the top. And what I wanna do is keep this fixed as I scroll through my prototype. So when I switch over to prototype mode, what you'll notice is I have an option over here for scrolling called fixed position when scrolling. I'm gonna go ahead and turn that on. Now when I open up the preview window and I start scrolling, you notice how that object remains fixed while everything else scrolls beneath it. And this was really simple to create. Now, if you've used any other app, you typically have to set one fixed header, one fixed footer, and that's it. But with XD, we kind of got rid of some of those limitations. So in this same very example, I'm actually gonna fix multiple objects. So I'm gonna go ahead, select this piece of text, select the search thing on the right, say fixed position for that, Maybe I'll even go ahead and like fix this bottom graphic that I have. So I'll go ahead and fix that as well. And let's see how that works. And now you can see I actually have multiple objects that are fixed as I scroll through this. Let's take this one step further. Not only can you have a fixed header, a fixed footer, or multiple fix, you can have fixed elements at any Z index. So what that means is when you fix an element, it doesn't have to be the topmost layer. You don't have to move it all the way to the top. You could even fix things in the background. So what that means is if I now decide I wanna fix this image, which you can see is all the way at the bottom, I'm gonna go ahead and fix this. And now what you'll notice is as I scroll, I get a completely different scrolling effect. So with XD, we kind of remove all these limitations around having to remember if you have one fixed header, one fixed footer. We allow you to really fix whatever you want in whatever position it is, and as many objects as you want. So using just this simple capability, you can create some really immersive experiences like this. So this is another basic example of where, for a mobile app, I've gone ahead and fixed the header, I've fixed the footer, 
and you can see the background with all the content is scrolling. But if you go ahead and you fix the header, the footer, a bunch of objects in the foreground, background, you can actually create some really interesting scrolling effects like this. And again, there's nothing special about what I'm showing you. It's just pinning different objects back and forth. So with, scroll, with uh, fixed elements, you really have that flexibility of creating some immersive experiences. Let's look at another one called overlays. So we've all had to build something like this at some point where clicking on the menu icon brings up a menu. Now the way we typically go about doing this is we duplicate the artboard, we add the menu on top of it, and then we try and do a simple dissolve transition between the two. So I've created a simple wire here and I say transition, dissolve, go to this artboard. So it looks something like this. But it doesn't really give me that effect of a menu that slides down, right? And if I wanted to do that, how do I go about doing it? So with XD, we've actually simplified that process as well. What I've done here is I've gone ahead and created my menu. Now the reason you can't see much is because the background actually has a background blur on it. So I have a background blur on this artboard and my menu is separate separated out on this artboard. What I can do is in prototype mode, select this, connect it to the menu artboard. We're gonna follow the same procedure again. My trigger is tap, but instead of a transition, now I'm gonna pick something called an overlay. When I pick an overlay, I get this little decoration on my base artboard, which allows me to adjust where this thing appears. So I'm gonna adjust it over there, and I'm gonna pick my action as slide down. Now, once I've done that, I open up the preview window. Whoops. Let's try that once more. Okay, so I open up the preview window, I click on the menu icon and you can see how it slides down. So again, small features, but it helps you really create those interactive experiences. And I can click to dismiss it. Now I can do the same thing with a keyboard. And here you can see when I bring up um, when I go to this screen and I try to bring up the search bar, you'll see a keyboard slide up. Now the reason you wanna really use overlays in your prototype is because of reusability. Imagine having to open up that same menu and bring up that same keyboard across 50 artboards. You don't have to duplicate every single screen with the artboard. All you have to do is connect your overlay to all of those artboards. So you can see how powerful overlays are because it allows you to reuse that same artboard multiple times across your design. So in case of this iPad app, you can see how this menu is actually covering all the artboards for me. So no matter where a user clicks on whichever screen they click and they try to bring up the keyboard or the menu, it will always show up. Now, that is sort of a quick introduction to some of the basic features like setting up an interaction, how you preview it in the preview window, what are overlays, what are fixed elements. I'm quickly going to pause and let Arun talk a little bit about how you can actually share this prototype with someone else. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. So now that you have learned basic prototyping, um, you have designed, you have wired all up and all these crazy wires going all over, um, you know, overlays and, and stuff. But what good if you can't share it um, and get feedback? And, and of course, prototyping and, and the entire process is always iterative, right? So um, if you have been using XT so far, um, you would have noticed a couple of differences here. Um, up until now, the sharing was like a popover on the top right corner here, um, which, which really was pretty restrictive um, to begin with. Um, there was less real estate, you know, and, and we heard a lot of great feedback from um, users like you all um, that the real problem um, when you start really working through is to be able to manage um, and share multiple links with different people that you are collaborating. Um, so that's perhaps, you know, one of the biggest reasons why we felt um, sharing is equally important. Um, and as you can see, um, you, after design and prototype, share is now the third mode in XT. Uh, what this allows us is to be able to have this great real estate where we can um, present great things, we can help you manage, um, show what's being shared and all the links that you have and be able to help you update and manage them all. 
So let me begin with um, the first advantage, um, you know, in, in sharing. So as you, as you can see, you have wired up, but these wires are all going all over the place. Maybe you have crisscross, there are some artboards that you have lined up uh, below. And it's really difficult for you to um, figure out, have all my artboards really going to come when I create and publish this link out? Well, now in XT, when you switch to share mode, um, all the artboards that have been wired will be highlighted. And if you see, everything else is grayed out. It instantly gives you that visual feedback of saying, oh, you know what? My home screen here seems to be not wired correctly. I'm missing it. So you, know, you can quickly go back, fix that, come back into share mode, and you see you know, that's getting included as well. So this is really helpful uh, before even you commit to you know, publishing and sharing out and then you know, going through all that hassles. Um, towards the right-hand side, if you notice, this is the share mode PI. Uh, let me talk a little bit about that quickly. So at the top, you have um, what we call as the URL picker. So you know, all the links that you publish now from a given document get listed in here. Um, and I'm going to cover that um, in detail a little bit while. And then you have the option of either creating a new link or you can manage those links which, um, in which you can, you know, let's say you wanted to delete that and, and, and things like that. Um, next up comes, you know, the view settings. And this is really important that I want to um, walk you all through. Um, what we have heard, and oftentimes uh, you might have found yourself, it's not not just every time that you want to share your work for review. Um, it can be for just presentation or you know, even user testing. Um, and and that, that was not very clear in XT in how to achieve that, like what, it, what should be the settings be, um, you know, which checkboxes should I do to get to presentation. I want to load it up in full screen, make sure if it's user testing there are no hotspot hints that you know, people can bypass. So all of that, um, we, know we have made it simple. So all you have to do, if you notice here under view settings, is a bunch of presets, right? And these presets are based on you know, the feedback that we have been hearing from customers. You know, really, we, we uh, narrowed it down to the most important things that we do with your designs every day, which is you want to share for review, you know, you want to, sh when you are done towards the end, probably you want to share out with your developers um, or you want to do presentation and user testing. When you choose one of these settings, um, XT is going to do all the, you know, check boxes and all the whatever settings that needs to be done. And when you create a link, um, it's good to go, right? And you don't have to worry about that. Um, so. Let me really quickly, you know, I have a bunch of links already published here um, in the interest of times. So I have a presentation link, I have a user testing link. So let me, um, you know, open the presentation link. Um, real click here, it opens in the browser, right? And right off, it, it opens in full screen. Um, you know, you can start presenting the same, you know, flow that Jonathan showed. Um, all your interactivity is right there. Um, and then, you know, if you notice, there is hotspot hints as well, right? So when you share this out or for yourself and you want to know, oh, where should I click next? So um, XD kind of highlights this, and then you can um, click on it and, and go further. Uh, the difference between presentation and, and user testing is if you notice here, there are no hotspot hints, you cannot navigate using keyboard, which means, which is the real thing that you want when you share this link out with your uh, users for test, they, they, you want them to actually interact with the design elements that you have so that you know whether your design is impactful. So XT would make sure that they cannot skip, they are not hinted, um, and really help you get that feedback. So um, let me, go back um, a little bit and talk about, you know, um, after you are making sure what type of setting, so what's the purpose that you are sharing for, um, you want to really control 
the access control on this link, right? So there are a bunch of ways in which you can um, uh, do that today in XT. The first one is what we call as a public link. So if you set this as anyone with the link, basically uh, when, you, when a link is generated and you share that out with either email or Slack or you know, pass it on with um, anyone, um, if they click on that link, they get the access. So basically it's public. A um, little bit more um, is that you can add a password to it. So think about it um, as you know, a password protected, let's say a file or a PDF that, that you are used to, right? So you can put a password on this link and you need to pass that password manually to whoever you share this link. If they put the password, uh, you know, they can then access. So um, let me quickly show it to you. So let, and there are a couple of rules for the password just so that you know, it's very simple and basic, just so that you know, it's, it's secure. So I'm gonna um, give it a password and then I'm gonna update this link. The link before that was totally open. So all I have done is uh, added a password. It's updated and when I now open it in browser, you see a password screen, right? So, and when I put the same password, it's gonna just open that up. So this is one level of um, protection. Um, but if you really wanted it to be, um, you know, more secure, because that's, that's how your client wants it, nobody should be able to access that, um, we have what we call as, you know, private sharing. Um, what I mean by that is only the invited people on it can access. Um, and the way you do that is on this link, I have invited you know, Jonathan and one of my other colleague, Harish, if you notice. So um, since I am using um, Adobe, uh, my official Adobe ID um, while running XT, it's, XT is gonna automatically pick all the email addresses from my organization. And you can imagine that would happen in your case, for your organization it would pick up. So let's say if I want to add someone else, um, if you see, notice here, you know, um, as I type, it's gonna show me a list of all the people in my organization um, based on that search results. So I can even, you know, invite Shantanu uh, on this, right? and say, hey, Shantanu, can you review? I'm just kidding, it's not a good idea. <laughs> I don't want this to be my last Max demo. So, um, so I have invited these two, um, and when they access that link, um, if you pass this link, what it's gonna do is, first of all, automatically trigger an email to those email addresses that you invited. So it's gonna land in their inboxes when they click on it, um, it's gonna ask them to log in um, with the Adobe ID. Uh, so in this case, you know, imagine that I have uh, logged in. Now, this is where um, I want to talk a little bit more about the collaboration features, right? Um, so you have created a link, you have shared it out, and you really want to collaborate uh, with your stakeholders. Um, there are a couple of ways uh, in which you can do, right? So right in the center, if you notice, uh, stakeholders can you know, view this link, they can interact, they can see everything that you have built out, looks good, and they are ready to give you feedback. Um, so on the right-hand side here, um, if you notice, this is the, the commenting panel, right? So um, the yourself and the, and the in reviewers that you have invited are free to comment here. Uh, so if you notice, you know, Jonathan has added a comment. Uh, so let me say this page is final. And then there are two, two types of comments that I can do. If I hit submit, it's gonna just add a comment without a context. Um, or if you really want to put some comment, uh, context, you can use the pin right here, right? So when you use a pin, you can actually put it on the design, and then when you submit, the person who's gonna read it 
is going to get that context, like which context is this comment on, just making it so much more easier uh, to make sure that you get the context and you are able to update the design uh, uh, accordingly. The other great advantage is that I can also do at mention. So let's say I can do an at mention, and then you get a list of uh, the reviewers on this uh, link. In this case, it's Jonathan. So I said, hey, Jonathan, can you approve this? And when you do that, XD sends an email notification to this person saying, you know, this is the comment, you need to take an action, and they can uh, revert back immediately. So um, let me show you one last great thing here, right? So you have shared this with your stakeholders. There is a bunch of commenting that has happened. You have updated your design. All that is great. And then you want your stakeholders to come back and review it a final time, right? And maybe it's not the whole thing. They want to review you know, screen 10, for example. And in this case, since it's 16, what, about, what if there were 50 screens and they want to review screen 20? Like nobody has the time to click through and get through screen 20, right? Now in XT, when you share a link, each of the links have what we call as the grid view. So when they click on this grid icon at the top right here, they are presented with you know, thumbnails of all the artboards that are present on that link. Um, they know which artboards have comments in them so that they can jump right into it. They can also see what are the other artboards that have been wired from this uh, screen, and they can click on it and jump right in. So it really makes it r easy and fast for yourself and stakeholders to you know, navigate these um, shared links. With that, I'm going to hand over back to Jonathan. All right. My mic's on. OK. So what we wanted to cover in the first piece was just some basic prototyping, talk a little bit about the sharing, because that's key to how you actually share your prototypes. In addition to whatever Arun just covered, you could also record your prototypes as a video using the preview window. Uh, you could test it on a real device using USB preview. So we have a bunch of different options in how you can actually interact with your prototype. Now, one of the things we've always championed on the XT team is really thinking about like what our customers want to do. And no more jazz hands is something we often ask ourselves. Like when we meet customers, what are the things they struggle to prototype? What are the things they struggle to convey uh, to their stakeholders? And for that, the next section I want to talk about is basically advanced prototyping. And I have a bunch of different features now within the advanced category that I'm going to take you through and show you examples of what you can actually create with XT. So we're going to touch a little bit about auto-animate. Uh, we're going to talk about two different types of triggers, drag and time. Then the two new features, which is hover and interactive states. So let's jump right into it. Now, before I actually show you what and how, let me show you an example of what you can actually create in XT. So here's an end-to-end -end prototype of something I created. So without me doing anything, after a couple of seconds, you're going to see an onboarding experience trigger. And you can see how you're not actually navigating to a new artboard. It's just animating objects on the same screen. I can then go ahead, skip. Now I can drag between these cards. I can even bring up an OLA, something that we just looked at. This is actually one of my favorite overlays because it's got the blur. And one of the other things you'll notice is the background blur actually renders in real time. So it gives you the most realistic experience. I can go ahead, click on this card, have it animate, uh, click on different objects, have vector paths animate. I can continue to scroll, um, switch between different artboards, and you can see how it animates between all of them. So you can build some really expressive prototypes in XT. And, the, and this example that I just showed you was created using just a couple of features. Auto-animate, I'm about to talk about it. Overlays, a drag trigger, and a time trigger. So let's start with auto-animate. So you have an artboard. And what I want to do is create an experience where if someone taps on this card in the center, 
I want that card to expand out, right? So sort of like a micro interaction in a way. So all you have to do in XD is go ahead, duplicate that artboard, and start designing that end state. Now what I mean by end state is all you have to do is imagine your animation, like what is the starting frame and what is the ending frame. And that's all you need to do. So I'm gonna go ahead, um, I'm gonna get rid of these two cards. So what I'm gonna do is delete them. And then on this screen, I'm just gonna make a couple of different changes. So let's say I resize this. Probably not such a good idea to resize that button. Um, gonna fix that a little bit. Oh God, forget it, it's going. All right, so I got another button here. I'm gonna move this text up, select this, send all of that over there. So starting off with a really basic example. So all I've done is I've deleted a couple of objects and I've resized something. Now, when I switch over to prototype mode, I can select an object and then just like I did before, drag a wire out, connect it over here. I'm gonna pick tap as my trigger. Now from my actions, I'm gonna pick auto animate. And once I've done that, I can pick whatever easing function I want. So I'm gonna pick snap. And then my duration is gonna be one second. So it's gonna animate for one second. So I go back to this artboard, I hit play, tap, and you can see how it animates that card. This was a very basic example of what you can do with auto animate. Now the way auto animate really works is when you connect two artboards using auto animate, what XD does behind the scenes is figures out which objects from the first artboard also exist on the second artboard. Then XD tries to figure out if there's a difference in those objects. Have you resized it? Have you deleted it? Have you changed the color? Have you repositioned it? And what we do is we automatically animate the difference between the artboards for you. So using auto animate is really as simple as creating your start state, your end state, and then allowing XD to sort of animate the difference between the two for you. Now let's take this one step ahead, right? So let's look at another example. So what I wanna do is, again, I, I wanna start with this screen and I wanna end over here. So go ahead, I'm gonna duplicate this artboard and then just like before, what I'm gonna do is, um, let me go ahead, create the prototype wire so it's set with auto animate. And now I'm just gonna start uh, designing a bunch of things. So I'm gonna move this, whoops. I'm gonna move this off the artboard. So I don't want that on the screen. Um, I probably don't want this. So let's get rid of that, move this here. Um, just for fun, let's rotate this thing. <sighs> it's hard designing when everyone's watching. It's going. Bye, I'm done. <laughs> All right, um, and then let's do something else. Let's rotate this over here. So I'm gonna rotate this. And for this, I'm gonna resize this card over here. And then for the button, maybe I can, you know, again, make a bunch of changes over here if I want to. Can even change the color and maybe increase the font size or this entire group size. Oops. All right. So again, I'm just making a bunch of random edits, color changes, size, position, all of that. And now when I open up the preview window, again, I'm able to animate between the start and the end state. So as you start playing around with auto animate, you'll realize that it's a really powerful way of like creating these micro interactions without even having to learn an animation tool. You don't have to worry about keyframes. You don't have to worry about how you animate them. You just visualize your start and end and let XD do all the heavy lifting for you. So here's another example of where using that same very principle, I've gone ahead, uh, created this flow where you can see I'm animating between different screens and then the same objects keep getting shuffled around, new objects appear in, new objects, um, some objects move out. Um, and then here I have a little tap trigger with a time. And I'm able to put together these really immersive flows where I'm mixing and matching a bunch of different things. 
Now, I want to show you another feature that goes really well with auto-animate. Um, we've been looking at tap, and everything's been like tap to go to this screen, tap to go to that screen. But what if you wanted to do a drag? So let's say I've got these three cards over here, and I want to be able to drag between them. You're going to do this exactly the way you did auto-animate. Start by duplicating this. And actually, first, let me set up the artboard. So what I want to do is I want to make sure when I drag, um, Something's off the screen, so I'm gonna move these off. Now, I'm struggling to position this, although we have, you know, contextual guides. If you need more guides, you can always drag out guides from the edge like this. So I'm gonna space that out here, okay. Now, what I'm gonna do is create a simple drag between these cards. So I duplicate the screen now. And now what you'll notice is, what I can do is actually move um, these cards a little bit. So I'm gonna go ahead, do this. And to start, I'm gonna keep it really simple. So what I'm gonna do is select this, connect a wire or an interaction. Some people call it the noodle. Um, and pick drag from the trigger. So now I go ahead, pick drag. What you'll notice is the action is automatically set to auto animate. And again, I can pick snap if I want. And now what I can do is when I start dragging, you can actually interact with that object and drag between them. Now again, this is another example where you don't have to really figure out where the drag position starts, where it ends, where your thumb is, and like what is the drag, oops, it automatically jumped to the next screen. That's the next feature. Um, but with XD, what we do is we figure out what is your starting state for the drag, and what's your end state, and we just allow you to scrub between it. So the direction of your drag is completely determined by how you position them. Let's look, at, let's look at another example where I'm gonna mess around with the direction a little bit. So prior to this change where I had all of them close to each other, now let's look at a slightly different version of drag. So instead of just spacing them out, what I'm gonna do is maybe move them a little bit like this. So I'm trying to create like a slightly different type of drag over here, just to show you examples of where, you know, how you could actually use drag and how the position is completely controlled by you. So go ahead again, and what I'm gonna do is create a drag wire, and then I can even create another drag wire back here, so it can, I can drag it both ways. And now you can see when I drag, I'm able to create like whatever freeform drag interaction I want. So if I drag it, little towards this and I let go, it snaps to that edge, and then I can drag it again, and it'll snap back to the other end point. So with drag, you really have the flexibility of creating whatever drag interaction you want. It could be vertical, it could be horizontal, it could be diagonal, you could mix things up, um, and you're not really setting any different properties like it has to be you know, horizontal or vertical. It's completely free form you have the ability to set that direction as you design. So that's how I actually created some of these other prototypes where you can see I'm able to drag between multiple screens. So here I have a whole bunch of cards. I'm dragging between them. Then I click on a card and it auto-animates auto to the next screen. Um, one of the other things I forgot to mention when I was talking about auto-animate is how powerful auto-animate is with different types of objects. So here I have a simple path. Uh, let me actually show you the path on canvas so you actually believe me. Um, if I go into design mode and I drill down into this group, you'll see it's actually a vector path. I don't know if you can see the anchor points on it. Um, I'll open up the layer panel so you can see it's an actual path over here. And what I'm actually gonna do now is show you how you can animate this as well. So when I click on this, you notice how the path actually animates. And the reason I'm able to do that is because, again, the same principle. All I've done is I've modified the anchor points on the next screen, and XD even animates anchor paths for you. So imagine being able to create some really expressive graphs or charts where you're animating different you know, paths along the way. It gets really fun and powerful to play around with this. Um, so we've looked at drag, we've looked at auto-animate. Let's look at another type of trigger uh, called time. So you remember when I showed you the prototype at the start, it automatically triggered an onboarding experience. Now to create something like that, you don't need the user to actually interact. 
you want to be able to control when it starts. So to do that in XD, all you have to do is select the artboard in prototype mode. And then let me get rid of all these wires so that you can see me create it for the first time. Um, okay, so I select the artboard, I drag out a wire, and now we've already looked at tap, we've looked at drag, we're gonna to touch upon keyboard, a voice and gamepad later. I'm gonna start with time. So I pick time. Now the first thing you'll notice is you've got a couple of options that are slightly different. Delay. Delay basically means when do you want this animation to start? So I'm gonna say, delay it for maybe 0.4 seconds. So it's gonna pause for 0.4 seconds before it actually triggers this. I want it to auto animate and I'm gonna set my easing to snap and my duration is gonna be, let's say, 0.8 seconds. Now, I'm gonna do the same thing for the next screen. Again, I'm gonna set a time-based trigger so that from screen A, it goes to screen B, from B, it goes to C, and then maybe it even loops back and forth between the two screens. So all I've done is I've actually just created some time-based triggers and it's automatically switching between artboards based on the delay and the duration that I set. So again, it gives you that flexibility of mixing and matching different triggers and using it for different purposes in your animation. Now, if you're wondering how I created this little, you know, light thing moving, again, it's all auto-animate. All I've done is on this screen, I'll open up my layer panel so you can see this. It's actually just a Boolean group. So if I open this, it's a simple rectangle with an ellipse and I've just applied one of the Boolean operations from here so I can clip through that rectangle. And then what I'm doing on the next screen is simply moving that same circle in my Boolean group. And Auto Animate actually animates all of this for you. So going back to what I mentioned earlier, depending on what objects you're working with, it can animate vector paths, it can animate text, it can even animate Boolean groups and allows you to really create some of these things. Now, the other thing which you may not have noticed in this is with auto animate, there are certain properties that we do not animate and we do that on purpose. So for example, if you change your font family between two screens, we don't animate changing the font family, we just switch the font family at the very start of the animation. Now the reason we do some of that is because the way we've built auto animate is to really look at how, uh, how animations are designed in the real world. So we've looked at the iOS platform, we've looked at Android, we've looked at material design, we've seen what some of the guidelines are over there for animating color, animating font size, and we sort of built auto animate to mirror some of that. So you can build some really expressive prototypes that they don't strictly follow those rules, but they help you make good choices with defaults. Like they don't animate font size for no reason at all. So this is sort of just a quick glimpse of, again, auto animate, drag, and time. Now I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about the two new Max features that we released yesterday, hover and uh, interactive states. So to begin with, I wanna start by talking a little bit about hover. Now over here, if you notice, I have this button and typically when you create a hover state, you've had to create two artboards, create a mouse in, create a mouse out wire. Now, if you have multiple buttons, imagine the number of artboards you would require. You would just have multiple artboards all spread out through your document where you just got duplicate copies of it. So what we tried to do was really solve it in a way where you're not wasting your energy or your canvas space creating multiple artboards. So the first thing you're gonna do to create a hover effect is start out with a component. So a component is similar to what a symbol is. So over here you can see I have a component, the button's already there. I have, a pro I have a section in my new property inspector which has a default state. Now what I'm gonna do is, let me do this from start so you can actually see this. Um, you can see me create this from start. So I'm gonna start by making this a component. It has a default state. I'm like, okay, great. Now I need a hover state. So I can click on this plus button and you'll see two options, new state and hover state. I'm gonna talk about both separately. Let's start with hover state. So I go ahead, click on hover state. I'm fine with the name, I hit enter. Now I'm gonna actually design my hover state. 
So all I've done so far is I've told XD, I'm about to make a bunch of changes. Just save these changes in my new hover state. So I go ahead, I'm gonna make some color tweaks over here. Just a little color change over here. Oops. All right. And now I'm gonna switch back to my default state. Now when I bring up my preview window and I scroll there, as I hover over the object, the hover state actually kicks in. And I've not even had to switch to prototype mode to create any interactions over there. So creating a hover state is as simple as that. You just start out with a component, click on the plus, add a hover state, make your changes, and it'll work out of the box for you. You can even make this, you can even make much more powerful hover states. So for example, uh, over here, let me ungroup all of this so you can actually see it. So I've got a bunch of different objects. I'm gonna start by selecting all of them. I'll make this a component, and then I'm gonna add a hover state on top of it. And in this hover state, let's say I want to maybe increase the size a little bit, and then possibly move this content up. So like give it a little subtle change when you hover on, on top of it. And let's say the gradient over here, let me darken that maybe a little bit. So I can apply a different gradient maybe. Um, let's see, okay, let's start with that. And now when I switch back to my default state, open up the preview window, you can see that again, I can create a hover state using whatever I want, like any kind of changes. Now, if you're wondering how all of this is working, it's as simple as you switch over to prototype mode, you'll see that there's a little wire that does not go to a destination. It just hangs over there. And if you look at the property inspector, you'll notice that there's, that wire has hover, and it already has auto animate as the action. So here's the real magic. Like, you can create hover states and combine auto animate with it. So what I just showed you previously where you could create those really immersive experiences, all of that works even with hover. Auto animate is just another option you could use with it. So you could create some really fun hover effects all through your prototype. So I'm just gonna do a couple to show you how powerful this is. Again, I'm gonna start out with this object, uh, ungroup it, and then make it a component. I'm gonna add a hover state on it. So that's done. Now in the hover state, I want this to rotate a little bit. So I've done that. Um, again, now when I open up the preview window, you can see as I hover, oh, it's already on the hover state. Remember to switch back to the default state. Okay, so I open it up, as I hover, you can see it rotates. So again, it's using auto animate to do all of that magic for you. Okay, so we looked at hover states, but that's not about it, there's more to it. So let's look at what some of the other states that XD allows you to create. So for this, I'm gonna switch out a little bit and show you another example over here. Okay, where's my switch? Okay, so what I have over here is a simple, you know, a toggle switch that I have. I, I wanna create an interactive version of this. So in order to do that, what I'm gonna start out with is just a regular, if you open this up, it's a regular group with an ellipse and a rectangle with rounded corners, that's it. I'm gonna make this a component. Now I'm gonna add a new state. So the difference between a new state and a hover state is a new state has no interactivity associated with it. Think of it as being able to create variations of the same object. So I'm gonna create another variation of this. Let's call it enabled. And then just like hover, I'm gonna make a couple of changes over here. Um, tweak the design a little bit. So let's say I wanna change the background fill for this. So I go ahead and make a couple of changes, change the color, okay. Done. So now I've got two simple states, default and enable. But for a control like this, I don't need hover, I need tap. And I wanna be able to tap and transition between different screens. Now if you were doing this prior to yesterday's release, you would have to create two different artboards and then create a tap and like fake the whole thing, right? But now with states, you don't have to do any of that. Hence, no more jazz hands. So. All you have to do is switch over to prototype mode again, select this little ellipse. I'm gonna start by creating an interaction on it. 
You saw I clicked on the plus button here. That's one option. I could click on the canvas. Now I'm going to pick auto animate because I love that feature. And then in my destination, I now also have the option of picking states. So apart from artboards, I can also pick states as my destination. So I go ahead, I select enable, done. Now what I want to do is I want to make sure that I can also switch back from the previous state here. So when I select my component, I can toggle the state again. So I switch to the enabled version and I repeat the same process again. So I add another interaction, but this time I create the wire back to the default state. That's it. So I've created one wire from the default to the enabled, one wire from the enabled to the default. Now I switch back to my default state, open up the preview window. Let me zoom in because I created the world's largest toggle switch. Um, and now when I click, you can see how it's actually animating between two states. So it's really powerful with what you can do with just two simple states and combining tap and hover. To give you a glimpse of really how powerful this is, yesterday during the keynote, Jamie Myrill spoke about Spectrum, which is Adobe's design system. And I've, all I've done is I've taken just five artboards. So, and this does not even cover the whole design language. So this is just like one artboard which shows you all the different button variations. This is one artboard which has like the action button variations. This is one artboard that has all the check boxes, radio buttons. So it's basically just five controls with so many variations. And I've only picked one of the themes. Like there's a light, a light, light. There's a dark, medium, dark. Like there's so many more artboards. With the new states feature, I basically reduced all of those artboards and variations down to just these five things. So when I select the button, you can see I have all the states for that single button just rolled up in there. And this is how powerful components are. Like you can create as many states as you want and you have the ability of constantly switching between them. Not just that, if I open this up in the preview window, again, the world's largest button, um, and I hover on it, you can actually see the hover state is also part of it. Similarly for the other options over here, you can see that the radio button is interactive. I can select the checkbox, I can flip the switch, all of that is completely interactive. So I've taken some really complex artboards with multiple variations and then just boil them down into simple um, flows like this. So here you can see even for the radio button and the checkbox, I have all the states baked right into this. So this is sort of a quick glimpse of what you can do with um, st states, what you can do with hover. Um, again, it's super powerful when you start combining with auto animate, when you start mixing up different triggers together. Um, and you can do some really immersive prototypes with that. Now, with that, I want to switch over and talk about the next part of our session, which is, okay, so we spoke about auto animate, we covered drag, we covered time, we spoke about hover, spoke about interactive states. Now it's time for some beyond screen. So with Beyond Screen, there are a couple of different fun things we do. So we've got voice-based prototyping in XD. We've got multiple interactions, which is a complete new feature we rolled out yesterday. And then we've got keyboard and gamepad-based triggers. So let's start out with voice-based prototyping. Now, this is an Amazon Echo Show device. It's basically a smart speaker with a screen. Now, if you are a designer who was designing for this, one of the biggest challenges you'll have is how do I design for a medium where the primary way of interacting is through voice? And even the response is again gonna be through voice. So how do you actually design for something like that? So with XD, all you have to do is continue designing the way you used to, and we give you the tools to actually bring voice into your prototypes. So here what I have is a simple flow where I wanna start from the Echo Show screen so this is my first screen, and I wanted to open up an app, and this is the launch screen of the app, and then it takes me to the next screen. So I just laid out, I sort of storyboarded the entire thing. Now what I can do in XD is I can go ahead, switch over to prototype mode, create a wire, and now from my list of triggers, I can go ahead and pick voice. So when I pick voice, you'll notice I get a little option to type a command, 
So, I am going to go ahead and say launch compass. Okay, that is the first thing. And then again, I can pick auto animate, I can pick transition, all of those options all exist over here as well. So, with just this much, designed two screens, created an interaction, added a voice command, I open up the preview window, and if I have done this right, when I hold down spacebar and speak the command, it should animate to the next screen. So let's try that. Launch compass. There you go. It Hi, Jonathan. Welcome to Compass. Okay, that's the like next part today? of the demo. <laughs> Calm down. Uh, okay, so a part of designing for voice based experiences is it's not a one way thing. You just don't have voice commands and you transition but you also have speech playback or you have audio playback. And that's a part of how you interact with these smart speakers, right? So what I want to do now is when I transition to that next screen, I want some sort of response uh, as a part of that interaction. So to do that, get rid of it first. Okay, there we go. I can select the destination artboard and now I'm actually gonna pick one of the triggers we just saw, which was time. I'm gonna go ahead and set this up and then explain why I did it. So I'm gonna set a 0.4 second delay and then in my actions, I'm gonna pick speech playback. And over here, I'm gonna say, hello, John. I can't even spell my own name, wow. Um, welcome to Compass. All right, let's do that much. And now what you'll notice is, I'll repeat the same flow. What was it that I typed? Oh, launch compass. Launch compass. Hello, Jonathan. Welcome to Compass. So what I just did was on the destination artboard, I set a time-based trigger, which was after 0.4 seconds of arriving on this artboard, then play the speech playback. So now you can see how you can actually start mixing and matching voice, tap, time, all of them together. And the beauty of time is you could basically set it up in a way where the speech playback triggers after a couple of seconds of actually arriving there. So now to take this one step further, let me mix it up with another new feature, which is multiple interactions. So from this screen that we just created, I wanted to go to the next screen. So on this screen, what I'm gonna do is create another voice-based trigger and I'm gonna say, um, which national parks ugh, are around. But then I also know as a part of testing this with stakeholders, not everyone's gonna say the exact same phrase, right? So I wanna be able to have a couple of more variations of this that the screen should respond to. Now, how do I do that? How do I create more than one wire from the same object? So that's another new feature we released yesterday, which is the ability to actually create multiple interactions from the same object. So you can see, although this has a wire, I still have the ability of dragging a second wire out, or a third, or a fourth, or a fifth wire. So I go ahead, add another wire here. Now I'll say, tell me more about Yosemite. All right, now let's try this out. Hello, Jonathan. Welcome to Compass. Okay, fine. Uh, which national parks are around? And you can see you how can it transitioned. Okay. You can see how it transitioned to the next screen again using that same voice command. Now, instead of that phrase, if I said, tell me more about Yosemite, it would do the same exact thing. Tell me more Hello, about Jonathan. Yosemite. Welcome to Compass. It's still transitioned. You can so visit any of these five national parks this month. Okay, which is why I'm not gonna go through the whole flow because she'll talk a lot. Because um, I've just set up voice playbacks on every single screen. But you can see how easy it is to put together a voice-based experience uh, using XT with a combination of speech playback and voice triggers. So this is sort of one of the other mediums that XD has been exploring, which is voice-based uh, prototyping. What I just showed you was just voice triggers, but we're evolving this to even support audio playback so you could create some more immersive experiences. Now, apart from this, one of the other areas that we've also been looking into 
is a keyboard and gamepad based triggers. So here I have an example of a simple, um, let's call it a mail app. And what I want to be able to do is I want, I want to create a couple of flows where if you click on this menu icon, I want it to expand and collapse the menu. But because this is a desktop app, I also want to be able to use keyboard shortcuts because that's how we work, right? So in order to do that, I'm going to go ahead, create a wire. I'm going to use the basic tap trigger first. So tap, auto animate, done. But now I also want a keyboard based shortcut. So I can create a second wire because now we have multiple interactions. Put that over there. And now instead of drag, I'm going to pick keys and gamepad. And all I have to do is press any key on my keyboard and it will assign that as a shortcut. So I've assigned the shortcut M over here. Now when I open up the preview window, you can see I can tap to expand and collapse. Or I can actually press M, oh, sorry, from this screen. And it does the same very thing. So you can use keyboard triggers, mix and match it with tap, time, drag, voice, all of that. Uh, again, this is an entire desktop app that is prototyped using keyboard triggers as well as tap triggers. And you can push this even further. So for example, here, when I click on the compose new email, it brings up an overlay, something we covered in the first part of the session. Or I could use a modifier key like command N, and that does the same exact thing for me again. So you can actually build some expressive prototypes which leverage more than just tap and hover, right? You can use keyboard triggers. You can even start stitching things together. So for example, over here, let me jump out and show you another flow where I have this screen open. And then I want to do the little iOS drag to delete thing. So you, you know, I'm using a simple drag trigger and I'm animating between two artboards. So I drag and then there's a time trigger which deletes it. And then I can press Command Z to undo. So again, you saw how a simple flow like deleting an email and then undoing it, I put that together using just three different triggers. So when you start playing around with them and start bringing them together, you'll be able to stitch together some really fun uh, interactions. Again, you can mix voice with this. Uh, I actually have a simple example for voice somewhere in here. If I remember what I'm supposed to do. Let's see, what was the shortcut I put in there? Shift enter, okay. So on this screen, if I press shift enter. Go ahead, I'm listening. So I, I kind of faked the whole Siri ex desktop Siri experience by using a keyboard shortcut to bring up the little thing and then have speech playback play after that. Um, so again, super powerful keyboard triggers, very helpful for desktop based prototyping um, or any other app design. We took this one step further and we said, well, keyboards are not the only piece of hardware designers work with. Uh, we actually have an entire industry which does not have a bunch of tools to create simple prototypes. And that was game design. And this was something we worked with several different gaming companies like Ubisoft um, and EA. And we actually helped them prototype and ultimately ship this feature where we now have gamepad support in XD. So the way this works is once my gamepad's connected, so you can connect an Xbox controller or a PS4 controller using Bluetooth or the USB cable. And once it's connected, let me just make sure it's connected. It is connected, hopefully. Let me just quickly check. Okay, great. So the way this works is all you have to do is connect your controller to your, uh, your Windows machine or your Mac machine. And then when you are in prototype mode and you create a new wire, let's say I create a wire going to this screen, just like when I pick the keys and gamepad option and I press the key on my keyboard, if I have a controller connected, Notice as I press buttons on the controller, it automatically assigns them right inside of XD for me. So we've actually made it really seamless to just pick up a controller, connect it by Bluetooth, and start prototyping with it inside of XD. So let me get rid of this wire so that I don't ruin anything. And then let me just show you a quick example of where I put together a prototype using this controller, and it's all using auto animate again. So I'm using the joystick to navigate between these screens. And then I'm using a bunch of different options again. 
And I forgot what I'm supposed to do now. Um, let's see. Something works. I'll press all the buttons. <laughs> nope. I give up. All right. The, the, oh, there we go. I don't know how that happened. But yes, that was the last screen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, so this was uh, a quick summary of what some of the features in XT are with prototyping. We've looked at, let me go back to my original presentation. Nope. Nope. Which one is it? Oh, there we go. Yes. Um, so in summary, we covered voice prototyping, we covered multiple interactions, keyboard triggers, gamepad triggers, and now the last one that I'm gonna let uh, Arun end off with is a little more on sharing and collaboration. Wasn't that great? Yeah. So I'm gonna quickly, um, basically run in 10 seconds. Uh, that's all the time that I have, and by the time I said this, I wasted two seconds. So I'm gonna show you, um, you know, the share for development. So now you have done all this great prototyping, uh, you have got your review with your stakeholders, you have done the changes, and it's ready to go uh, to your development team. So again, in share mode, you know, this is a screen in, that Jonathan showed, which was doing a little bit of time transition and auto-animate. Um, and all you have to do now is, again, in your view settings, in share mode PI, you choose development, right? You have a bunch of options here. You can say, okay, this is my, um, I want to export it for web. Um, and if you see down here, you know, based on the assets that you have marked while designing. So oftentimes you want your developers to choose that asset um, and, and not create on their own. So you can mark them. Um, and, and it would export along with um, while creating the link. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna just switch to a already published link. Um, so design specs, you know, um, the first thing that I'm gonna tell you is that we have made design specs richer. And by that, what I mean is your developers can now actually experience it because this is an interactive prototype. They will experience you know, all the interactions that you have done, you don't have to send them a separate prototype link. All that is gone, it's just one single link which has this rich prototype experience. And at any given screen, they can switch to now, at the right-hand side, the specs mode. So, you know, and they can get all the red lines, um, all the relative distances, they can also get um, you know, the assets that you might have marked. Um, if, you, if you notice down right here, um, they can choose to export as ping or a, like, or a PDF and then choose that to download it for themselves. Um, if you notice, you know, um, in the PI section here, um, it gives them information about the size that you have used for this screen, all the assets, all the colors. They can just click on it and copy and paste them into their uh, code. So, so it would copy the hex code. Um, they, can, they can also see, um, since you exported it out for web, they can also see uh, you know, the CSS now in design specs. So again, a very quick way they can select this, copy the CSS, and paste it in their files um, as they are building it out. So it really helps them get to that um, quick finish line um, of all the interaction that you have built uh, using Adobe XD. All right. So with that, um, what I want to leave you all with is sort of just a couple of places you all can go learn more about everything I spoke about. Uh, rather than one specific blog post or like one video, these are my two favorite people on the team, uh, Howard Pinsky and Danny Bumon. Howard has an entire web page called letsxd.com. So even if you want to learn more stuff about XD, that's not prototyping, but it's more design, it's more collaboration, sharing. He has some of the best videos out there. He, in fact, if you want to learn more about states and hover, uh, if you go to letsxd.com, he has an amazing beginners tutorial with a bunch of UI kits that you can download and get started with. Uh, Danny does all our product videos, and she does some amazing video content. 
So I would encourage you, go check out Danny's YouTube channel. She's got everything over there for you. Let'sXD.com by Harvard. Again, another great resource uh, for anything you re need across with XD. But yeah, so that was it. So we, we looked at some of the basic stuff in prototyping. We looked at the advanced. We looked at what is beyond screen. Uh, for the coming year, there's definitely a lot of more we are investing in with animation and choreography. So everything you saw is sort of um, a continued story. It doesn't end for us, right? With voice, we are going to continue to evolve that, bring in audio, add in a bunch of more features there. Um, with some of the auto-animate features, we are working on ways in which you'll be able to refine your animations. But again, sort of uh, not just throwing in a timeline into XD, because we don't want to do that. We really want to think what would be the best way a screen designer or someone who does not have a background in animation, but you could still refine animations in XD. So we are working on some really fun things there. And with states, again, this is the tip of the spear. We've only started our journey with states. There's a lot more we'll be adding in the coming year uh, to improve how states work. So yeah, I hope you all had a great time. Uh, please do take the survey because it helps me and Arun sort of plan for our next session and improve and add more things depending on your feedback. But otherwise, I hope you all had a great time. Uh, we have some time, so I'm around if you have some questions. Otherwise, you can come find us at the community pavilion. We'll be at the XT booth with a bunch of other uh, team members. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.